All right, welcome to Arnav, Joseph, and Daniel Levy. We really appreciate you spending some time with us this morning to update us on some of your projects. Before we do that, though, why don't you remind our listeners a little bit about who you are and how you got involved with aerospace. Let's start with Arnav. Hi, my name is Arnav Joseph. I'm going to eighth grade at the Y School. And I got interested in space because I really like the, I really like the educational, um, I really like the educational part of it. It um, really interests me. Daniel? Um, hi, I'm Daniel. I'm also going to eighth grade at the Y School. Um, I got interested in space. I, I really like the technical aspects. It's very interesting for me. And I also really enjoy a lot of the projects that we do. Great. How long have you guys been involved in what we refer to as the Wolfpack CubeSat development team, right? Which is part of the Aerospace and Innovation Academy. Um, how, when did you get involved? You can just kind of share intermittently, just speak. Yeah, I just got involved um, at the, uh, at, in sixth grade, when I entered sixth grade at the, the Y School, back before we, before the Wolfpack separated from Weiss. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just, I joined in fifth grade Mm -hmm. Um, I joined in fifth grade as, um, part, as part of the, um, wolf pack and then, yeah, just kept going from there. Okay. Well, let's find out a little bit, uh, let's drill a little deeper and find out what specifically you are working on or have worked on that you really enjoyed. So, um, Arnav, tell us about some of the projects that you're most excited about. So recently we, so recently myself and a couple of um, WCDT members participated in the, in the Plant the Moon Challenge, which is a challenge um, administered by the Institute of Competition Sciences. And um, basically, what we do is um, we plant we plant these different crops under under um, artificial lun lunar regolith. Um, and our experiment had to do with three lighting conditions: um, red light, white white fluorescent light, and natural light as our control. Because if we're actually going to plant these crops in space, we're not going to have you know, natural sunlight. Um, another another um, project that I'm working on right now is our um, two presentations for um, the Coast Park Conference in Athens, Greece. I'm doing one of the papers are was our experiment on the for the Plant the Moon Challenge, and my other paper has to do with the um, M. capsulatus bacteria and how um, th this bacteria can be like manipulated in space for space travel. Okay. Tell us a little bit about that. How? Tell me a little bit more about the bacteria itself and why uh, and how it can be manipulated. So basically, this bacteria is known as a polyextremophile, meaning that it can survive in different harsh conditions, including the uncertainties of outer space. So it utilizes this process called anaerobic digestion, which means which um, means that the bacteria breaks down in the absence of oxygen, because that's really what space is. And um, basic and basically, it can, it can, it breaks down and produces and produces um, a chemical called methane. I'm pretty sure you've heard about it before. So um, that that's why it's called a methanotroph. It's a methane producing bacteria. So it can be used for many purposes, including. So my paper focuses on turning this on turning um, organic um, organic compounds such as an astronaut's waste or excretory product, and they can turn it into edible food which can be eaten in space so this so this can solve like this sort of food um food supply problem that for long distance space travel yeah that part always when i you know i always get the pleasure of going through student papers before they go and i'm like hmm this is going to be an interesting selling time how are you going to sell this to astronauts They're like hey, we're going to eat our poop well uh, but, yeah and the the, the and Arnav knows full well we have to recycle, you know, every molecule we can in space because in the vacuum of space there's, you know, little materials that you can draw on. So you have to just regenerate everything. And so Arnav is smartly studying nature to see how we can use things that already exist in nature to help us. Um, basically, we want to build a big compost pile and be able to turn everything that's organic. You know, if you think about a compost pile, we need to do that, even with plastics, if we can, in space. Space, uh, the volume that you have within your vehicle <clears throat> is precious. It takes a certain amount of space to grow food for every person. Um, it has to be done. You know, we, we can't possibly build spacecraft to take all the food we'll need to go on these really long-term trips. 
So uh, using bioregeneration and recycling and natural processes is the most space efficient way. Oh, that, you know yeah. what I'm thinking? That's going to help you when you're when you're presenting too, because now that you're mentioning the idea of a compost bin, like I didn't see, like they have com ones that individual homeowners, like we, when I was a kid and we had like five acres, we would just throw all of our scraps out into like an area in the, on the acreage, right? But, and then use that for our soil for the garden. But nowadays people live in, you know, homes where you can't really kind of do that, but you can buy these individual compost bins. I know I've seen them at the green school. I think there's a neighbor that actually has one. So it, it's a matter of figuring out the size, I would imagine, of this composting mechanism that would allow you to take their byproducts and to yeah, use the, that there. The story is even more, um, I guess, nuanced and rich is that we have to figure out how to create microbiomes in space, not just of how we recycle the materials, but also which microbes we need in there. As Arna would tell you, we have decomposers and detritivores. They're really responsible, things like earthworms and the bacteria that are able to take complex organic things and break them down into building blocks that can be reused really by other living things to make uh, what we need, including food and oxygen. It reminds me of the microbiome within our own guts that yes. kind of do the same yes. thing, right? So Arnav, have you ever been to Athens, Greece? Is this something you're looking forward to? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I've never been before. Tell me about the first time you presented. I think I remember that uh, far away from home. Yes. Yeah, so the first time we, so the first time we did like an actual presentation at a conference was at the um, Hawaii International Conference of Education in in um, Waikoloa Village in Hawaii. So we presented on artificial on the importance of artificial intelligence in education. I actually presented on I actually presented actually on two poster presentations I presented on the AI one and then I also presented on distance learning and how that is going to like basically shape the future of education. Outstanding. Yeah. Okay. Um, and now let's let's talk to Daniel some and then we'll come back. We have some follow up questions obviously for both of you but um, Daniel share a little bit about the the passions or the work that most uh, excites you that you do with the wolf pack. All right. Um so some of my favorite work that I do for the Wolfpack is involving the microbits. So microbits are basically these small computers. They're very easy to use and are designed to teach children programming. <clears throat> and what we do with these is we, like, uh, for example, we, we use these for our um, experiments in space. And we also use them to reach out to students and teach them coding, even if, like students, especially who have no coding experience prior to that. Um, in fact, like for example, um, in fact, we latched a high altitude balloon with a few microbits doing an experiment uh, a few days ago. And we are planning an experiment called the FlipSat that is going to test their ability to function in space. Um, I've also been working on, uh, we're, we've also been organizing an event, a hackathon, where bas children basically have 24 hours to complete a set of tasks, such as working with sensors, moving a motor, and to complete a project of some sort. And the winner will actually have their code flown into space for the flip set. In addition, we've also used the microbits to teach some students who have no prior experience in programming. Yeah, my, uh, let's, let's break, that's three really cool things. So we'll do them in the order that you brought them up. First of all, uh, I was in Indiana with some other Wolfpack students at a, a workshop. And you're right, Dan Daniel and uh, another kid, Alex Temperman, they wrote this fantastic code that we were able to run on a high altitude balloon to show that microbits are able to talk to one another with a, a, a little antenna and a receiver. And uh, we were able to run Daniel's code uh, and on the microbit. And I wanted to, I haven't seen Daniel since we got back uh, late last night, but it went really well. And I was uh, really proud of how well uh, even kids that weren't in on the location, we're able to get some work done and coordinate with the kids on site. So that was fantastic. And we have beautiful imagery and maybe we can share a link to some of our um, posts that have some of the images and, and data we collected. Yeah, just our Facebook page alone has a lot it was, of- It was really well done, Daniel. So that was outstanding. I wanted to thank you for that. Um, the second thing you mentioned was the, what was the second? The third thing was the hackathon. We were talking about the eight, um, and oh, flip microbits and yeah, flip yeah, flip that. That's where my question comes from. Yeah, so I'll and, let you and, go first. And, and the microbits for our listeners are actually produced by the BBC in the UK. 
And I think their goal was to put one in every child's hand in the UK to really, it, it, Daniel really he nailed it there. They're designed to help rookies, like really young kids, really start learning how to code. And it's, it's Python in the background. So Daniel is very good at that. And then, of course, the third thing you mentioned is Daniel spent several weeks coming with me to a community center in West Palm Beach, where he was able to uh, teach the Python himself to some kids that had never had any coding. So fantastic way to use your space. And we'll talk about the hackathon in a minute. Well, what I want to go back to is you mentioned the flip set. So we did a podcast like before you all with William and Theo, and we're talking a little bit about the flip set. And the flip set, of course, is a cube satellite for our listeners um, that has been kind of in the in the process of being developed or thought about for quite some some years. And what I love about how now we have new students working on these older projects, it just shows you that space work in general takes time, right? Like it doesn't happen overnight. So we're still, now we're seeing the flip side come to fruition without the help of NASA, which is kind of cool. But in addition to that, what I'm also learning is that there's so many different components within it. So within that, you have the engineering aspect of a student who's building and designing and testing and flying an actual satellite. We have a student who's raising money in order to launch that satellite without that aid. So that's a philanthropic and entrepreneurial kind of aspect. And then we have your side, which is going to be the coding parts of that. So we have like three distinctly different um, areas of interest for our students to be able to work on one major project. So Daniel, when you think about that aspect, right, and, and that you're part of something, this larger project that's been ongoing, I'm sure at times it must be frustrating, right? The amount of time that you're putting in. How do you... How do you kind of remind yourself that it's a long-term goal and it's not something that's rewarded necessarily the next day? Well, um, in those cases, when it's a really long-term goal and I'm putting a lot of hours into it, I feel it helps to kind of remember what exactly I'm working toward. And I mean, normally it's enough for me to continue, to continue going. Right. And since you're going into eighth grade, this is a project theoretically now, like this is now becoming an area that you're a lead on, right, for the most part, that you can see through, even in through your high school years. So that's one of the questions I have for both of you. Are you guys taking these, um, whether it's the plant, the moon, and the idea of bacteria and like creating food options and space, because that's what the bacteria and plant, the moon does, uh, Arnoff, in some instances. So your area seems to be biology and, and food sustenance and space. And, and Daniel's is this coding and how we're making this more accessible. So are you going to take these, I know you're already doing papers, but maybe into science fair projects next year, something that you can kind of actually extend? Let's start with Arnoff and we'll come back to Daniel. Yes, I'm actually planning to use my plant the moon project as my science fair because norm because normally for our science fair we have we have it's like in the first month of school we need to have like our science fair projects done and since this is and since this is like a pretty long project since you know you're growing crops mm -hmm. it takes like a pretty long time to do that so I so I'm glad that I did it at the time that I did it before like instead of doing it when school starts. Got it. So that one is obviously done already, but I was thinking more along the lines of that bacteria. So is that bacteria something that you could like actually buy from some science company somewhere? Like you need buy tardigrades. Well, could he get some of that and like test on well, it? Well, the theoretically he could acquire it, but the rules for the regional science fair that these oh. students participate in does not allow middle school students to purchase uh, microorganisms like that. They, so the bacteria. You're, you're not allowed. They're really inhibited at the extent to which a middle school student can work High with bacteria. High school? Would he be able to do it in if, a year? Uh, for instance, if you were in a BSL-2 lab, uh, like a legit lab, uh, you would have more liberty to work with bacteria in that way. Think about that, Arnav, as you, so obviously you have yours for next year, but as you move, if this becomes like your long-term project and you're going to turn it into many different things, like that's what we talk about all the time, right? Papers, multiple papers, multiple presentations, multiple projects and competitions, you might be able to extend beyond the plant the moon for next year into actually working in high school where you actually take that bacteria and see if you can start making that happen. That'd be kind of cool. Daniel, what about you? Science fair with micro, with some kind of coding or? Um, Normally, I do science fair with some coding project. Of the past two years, I did uh, an uh, I did an AI related project, and then a, an automatic uh, water, a plant water. The past two years, and um, I, I I always really enjoy these projects because I can use everything that I know from coding and everything that I enjoy. Right. And and I also, I mean, I would like 
also to incorporate some of the things I have from the wolf pack, like maybe uh, like microorganisms in the future when I am allowed to. But yeah, this is this is like my favorite uh, thing, abiding by the the uh, regional rules that they have. Right. Would micro bits be? I mean, I know that we say that that's to put it in younger hands. Is that too far below what you'd be able to use in middle school, or is there a way that you might be able to use them and test them with some younger students, like a large number of younger students? I mean, is there any way you can actually employ micro bits into your project, or is that too too basic at that point? Um, it depends exactly what we want to use the micro bits for. Um, if you want to test something like the flip set with what does with the the bit flips and see if it works in space, then that would probably be fine. But if you were going to use it as a microcontroller, you it would be um, le less uh, impressive. I, it's not going to be against any rules, but right. It's just less capable. But but in high school, right? Like as you said, by the time you're in high school, I'm thinking now, right? Because as I'm drawing these kind of connections together, same with Arnon. By the time you're in high school, flip set should have been up and running by then to where you'll have been able to test your code to see if it works. And that sounds like you might be able to well, do something well, with it. Well, actually we need to run ground studies prior to the flight. So we have a basis of comparison. Uh, how did they work on the ground in one atmosphere and on the surface versus how do they work in free fall? So that literally could. Um, I have some follow-up questions. I wanna circle back. Um, first of all, you guys, we were talking about how do you you know, when you don't get instant feedback or instant gratification on your project, um, is it not true that you the abstracts that you wrote, you wrote them early in the year, but you're not going to the conferences until July, August, and September? Um, what when did you start writing for the conferences that you're going to in Paris and in Athens, Greece, and small set in August? Um. I personally started the abstract around January, early January, after we got back from Hawaii. And uh, we've submitted them in early February, late February. And now, now that now um, we've, we've been working on them for a few months. And I mean, like, but it really feels good to reach all those checkpoints along the way and to see all my work accumulating and coming up to and, and uh, becoming something that I could actually take to a conference and present over time from what it started as at the abstract. That's right. And and I want to recall, uh, uh, am I right, Daniel, you were actually in Atlanta with Santiago in May at the Abcycon conference. Uh, and that was the first time any of our Wolfpack had ever presented at this astrobiology conference that meets every two years. Did you enjoy that trip? Oh, yeah, it was, it was actually very, very, um, well, well, it was, um, Abcycon that was actually my first real science conference after it was my it was after Hawaii, um, and I learned a lot of things there. I watched a few panels, and it was very interesting to see exactly how a science conference is really like. They're different, right, from the educational right. conferences, yes. like completely. Much, that's why the writing much, has to be yeah. higher level, like definitely. Right. So. Well, much well, less I just have, yeah, I just have a couple of concluding uh, thoughts on the hackathon that you mentioned. One, for our listeners, uh, you can learn more about the hackathon at wolfpacksat.org slash hackathon. Okay, so go to our wolfpacksat.org uh, slash hackathon. And, and the theme for this year, as Daniel alluded to, uh, which is a nice blend of both Arnov and Daniel's work, it's actually space agriculture. So the kids that compete from around the world are going to be put into teams and they're going to be be given some tasks to see how well they can use micro bits to create a plan to grow uh, different kinds of species of plants that we're going to give them on that day. So wait, how you... would they use micro bits to determine what plants to use? I thought isn't micro bits coding? So try sure. to explain that to me. I'll let Daniel answer that. Um, well, if they would want to determine exactly what plant to use. Another really cool aspect of computer science and programming that I find really interesting is artificial intelligence. And even with the very simple machines like micro bits, you can create like some form of intelligence with it and use like a, like you can use anything from a formula to even a full blown intelligent software to determine exactly what you want, what plant you want based on a, a number of factors, like let's say a time to grow, number of water right. required. And, and, 
And very specifically, you can get sensors to accompany your micro bits like um, gas sensors for CO2 or oxygen, soil moisture. Imagine you have timers, you use your micro bits to provide just the right amount of light. And depending on the species, there'll be frequencies of light. So you'll be able to optimize the growing parameters, uh, light, temperature, gases, moisture, et cetera. Was I correct in hearing you say earlier too that when you do this contest, which is international, right? Like in India, I know for sure that somebody's going to be tasked with writing the code that is ultimately going to be tested on CAPSAT. Is that how this is linking to that? Yes. Um, so I believe we were, we we're going to take the winning code um, of course, making sure that it works and everything, and then putting on on the on the flip set as like the the first pri the first prize. Right. For, and, and for our listeners that did not hear Theo and William describe flip set, flip set is a hosted payload. So we're going to be one of four payloads inside an apparatus that's attached to something called an Esper ring. So we won't be a free flying CubeSat on our own, but we'll be a free flying mission. I'm sorry, will be a hosted payload mission. And that mission, which um, goes all the way back four years when Theo was in middle school, has to do with, can we shield the micro bits in different ways and look at how we can protect those bits, which were never designed to go to space? Can we keep them from experiencing bit flips when they're in orbit around the Earth? So is the code that they would be working on in the hackathon related to the bit flips or is it related to the foods? Um, the hackathon is actually got a theme of space agriculture. Right. So they're writing code related to these uh, farming, like growing food in space. So it's not related to the mission, but because but it'll fly we're, on it as a secondary. Yes, because payload. we're okay. using micro bits, the theme is let's get kids writing code. I see. So in other words, CubeSats can they can test more than one thing. There's there are um, other missions. So uh, yeah. On the have, we actually tested several things on one micro bit, which is just an example of that. But also for the flip set, the, the code is going to be for space agriculture, but we're going to have another device listening in and checking for the bit flips. I see. So it's like doing multiple. So that's why we need to have people who are coding to make all these other things happen, because that seems like then instead of just having individualized tests, you can have it programmed to do more than one thing. That's a time saver, certainly. Right. I, I have a longer range question for you guys. I just came back with, um, you know, I, I was with some Wolfpack kids that were college students all the way down to seventh grade. You guys are going into the eighth grade. You've already done two really good years of work. What would you like to do and say that by the time you graduate high school related to aerospace and maybe the Wolfpack? Let's start with Arno. Something that I always like, some like one of my goals for like um, being in the Wolfpack is like to go to a bunch of conferences because like, th because this is like where you get a lot of speaking experience and this like really helps in life. So I think like one of my goals for but um, but so like one one of my goals as part of the wolf pack is to like attend different conferences so like I can gain speaking experience and and like experience just talking to people because I know that will help like a lot in life. You, you will definitely yeah. build your networks, won't you? But not only that, Arnav, like what Daniel said, this will be your first science conference, right? When you go to the IC, IC, <laughs> Daniel, where do you see IC? No, no, not IC. I'm sorry, Coast Bar. I'm thinking IC, but like. The IC in the, the places like that is so different, right? It's so different as far as the people who are there, the number of people. So this will be your first scientific um, conference. You're going to see that there's a different feel to it. In Hawaii, it was, well, it was Hawaii. It was awesome, but it was like laid back and chill and very, you know, like, oh, everybody was kind of on Hawaii time. Science conferences are at high energy, high level. So I think that's a really good thing to say, you know, especially to say under my belt, I want to do one conference a year, which means you come up with newer ideas and you've got some really good um, starts as far as ways you can take your, your ideas with the biology and take it to another level of research that you can continue to recycle and extend your papers for those things, right? Right. And, and Arnav, I'd agree with you. Uh, when you go to a conference like that, I look at it like everybody in the room is smarter than I am, and they all do the things that I'm interested in. So I'm just there to soak up. And they're up. so happy to talk to and you guys. Yes, and, and they are. They really are. You guys always tend to impress the older group because you do stand out. You're much younger. Yeah. And 
those folks are already doing the things that interest you. So uh, I just think it helps accelerate you get to the in the direction you want to go. All right, Daniel, what are your thoughts? Where do you want to be in a few years? Uh, well, I have a, a few things that I want to do, but mainly I want to get uh, my code actually in space, which I have not yet. Uh. Um, I also, like Arno said, I really do enjoy going to the conferences and listening and meeting people and, and going places. Uh, AbSciCon, which we mentioned earlier, was a lot of fun, mainly because I got to present and meet some people. And I'm really, I'm really looking forward to going to Athens later in the summer and, you know, presenting all, all that work that I did over the past few months. Um, it's a rigorous process, right? Both of you have been handling my copious edits, you know, with aplomb and you, you know, you haven't balked at that. Sometimes people give up. Um, and I warned everybody up front, like it's a, it's people don't understand. These are middle school students who ultimately are presenting and, and writing for university level conferences. So to get you guys to that level, it's no insult to you all at all. You just haven't been exposed to enough years of, of writing to even, or reading at, at that level, right. right? So you guys should really pat yourselves on the back when you get tired of getting emails from me with more edits and, and you think that I'm, um, I'm on you, just know that it's gonna pay off big time for you. And your writing overall is gonna improve in every aspect just right. because you're at such a high level. And, and, and so for our audience, these guys are really doing about five different unique tasks. One, they've got to do some research in their topic as Arnav did, he carried out his experiment with some, some other students. So you got that body of research, you've got definitely an abstract normally, which is accepted first. Then these students are writing research papers. Uh, then they are preparing their slide presentations and then they have to rehearse their presentation. So these, as you guys talk about your networking social skills, these are all just the prelude to get in front, to just to earn just your to spot stay. on the stage. And, and then you guys, of course, knock it out of the park. Well, and because we break it down into parts, right? I think that's something that our listeners might um, need to know too. It's not like you guys are just, yes, you're working a lot, but by breaking it down into manageable parts that you're learning how to manage that time for these larger tasks, which is a great skill as you guys enter, not only college, but into the workforce. Like, how do I get from point A to point B? I don't just wait till the night before. I, bits and pieces. Along well, the way, right? uh, my final thought is this for you guys, and I, you guys know that I don't just blow you up with compliments for no reason, right? But I will say this, since, um, since our trip to Hawaii at the very first week of January, this has been the most productive year for the Wolfpack by far, even going back uh, to the earlier CubeSat iterations when we were all at Weiss. I can say this, we have never done more volume of work than we have since January. And you guys have literally been the two kids that have been most uh, engaged and growing and most improved and really doing high level work. So I wanted you to know that um, it does not go unnoticed when you guys give a really good effort. So I'm really proud of you. And now you, you got it in the public space for all eternity. So. All right. Well, normally, guys, we ask about any advice. So I'm going to let you have some final words on, you know, for, for maybe students your age who are reluctant about joining. And remember, they don't have to be in South Florida now we, because of- Or, or even our younger, yeah, like even, our even fifth, younger, graders, fifth graders, right? What do you, what would you say to even your siblings coming behind you about why they should get involved or, or, or you know, staying involved? Let's start with Daniel. This one, we'll close it out with Arno. All right. Well, um, to anyone who's like reluctant to join, I and mean, personally, for me, it was a really good experience to go to banquets and meet people. And it really, it really, well, uh, I got a lot of experience and um, opportunities to speak and do some interesting work. We went to NASA a few times and it's all been really, really, really nice. Um, also learned a lot of things like, uh, for, like for the community centers, I learned how different it is to be, to know a lot about something and to be able to teach it. And um, uh, it's, it's, really, it's really a good experience. It's, it's uh, really, in my opinion, it's really unique and compared to a lot of other things you can do at school, like a, a, um, anything you can find there. It's, it's really, well, I, I, I'm gonna, personally, I really enjoyed it. That's, all right. So it sounds like you're, it sounds like overall, it's just that having those opportunities that don't exist. Otherwise, sometimes you don't even know that those are even things. And then all of a sudden you're kind of jumping into them and you're like, oh, actually I just did that. And I didn't even know it existed. Right. So that's right. a really we, good point. We trick you into having fun by making you work hard. 
So Arnav, what are, what are your final thoughts for everyone listening today? So, so for some advice for people that are um, reluctant to join the wolf pack is, so it's a couple of tasks, actually a lot of tasks are going to be really hard to complete, but you just have to like, just keep going through with it. Um, so for example, when I just started coming to the wolf pack, one of my first tasks was um, participating in the space settlement competition and you know, being a being a new member to the team, it was like a it, it was like a pretty hard process because like because I because I had to come up with like a lot of these different I different ideas and like how would on uh, how would we create a settlement in space sort of like that, and it was and it was actually pretty it it, it was a pretty hard task, but eventually you get through with it and then with that experience you get you you get a bit more comfortable with other tasks like. Missy editing your papers and stuff like that. Right. <laughs> That's a task in and of itself, isn't it? You know, it? Uh, what you use the word comfortable, but in my mind, I heard you say, you know, I, I was thinking confidence, right? As you as you get little things done, your confidence grows. Wouldn't you agree? Out of that uncomfortable level, right? right. You're yeah. uncomfortable for a while, and then it just makes it easier the next right, time. Right. Daniel, you had your hand raised. Um, yeah, I just need to give one more piece of advice. It's very good for your resume. Uh, that's true right like think about it you have things and if you haven't started right i'm telling you guys start recording this stuff now now you have a podcast to add to your list right right and you guys are building a, a really nice body of work that i think will impress you know the high schools that you want to go to or or the universities yeah. because you're starting young you're doing real work you're engaged with adults I, i'm you know great 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 advice from both of you well, guys, we want to thank you for meeting with us this morning. And of course, uh, you know, we, we continue to look forward to doing great work with you and seeing you both in Athens. Thank you. Thanks for having us on the on the podcast.